Rodriguez Salamanca. I work at the clinic. And today with the PC, we're going to share uh, a little bit of how this season, season um, went and some other things. So, first, um, I have to tell you, we're going to play a little bit of a game with your phone. So, if you um, are in Twitter, you can follow me and get to the, the link really easily. Or you can go to the Facebook uh, PIDC page. Otherwise, you can use your browser and your smartphone and type this. That way you remember, you will always remember how to type my last name. It's a way for me to remember, you guys remember how to type my last name there. Now, if you don't have a smartphone, then you can text to this number, this, uh, this message, and then just vote uh, on that same thread of messages, okay? So stay a, I'll give you a couple of seconds there to catch up. If you're looking for um, the link on Twitter, if you see the earlier tweet from ISU Plant Pathology and go to Tweets and Replies, the, the link is right there too. All right, let's try it. So we can start with an icebreaker to make sure that you guys, you know, if this is working. Are you a student, faculty, professional, scientific, postdoc, other? You can lie here because really it's all to make sure that it's working. A couple more seconds. Okay, good. It keeps changing. Okay, so we're going to start with kind of like one sample that PC and I work together. Um, and in this, this particular photo here, think about it as case A, and then the other one is case B, okay? So look at them closely. Um, anyone knows this, this plant? Have seen it in the field at all? Hops? Corn? No, wrong. <laughs> Stops. <laughs> All right, look at it closely. Remember, this is A, this is B. And which one of the two makes you suspect disease? Um, maybe hops down in mildew. What you would expect from a down in mildew? Can and then respond in, in, in a, in a, in a uh, traditional way rather than. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you can write it on a piece of paper or just say, hey, you can shout. A, B, C. Don't know. <laughs> so in our presentation, we're gonna go we're gonna give you the answer to this towards the end. But I do a lot of this uh, with the extension presentations that I do for growers. Yesterday on the high tunnel um, for commercial vegetable production, there was this uh, program in Ryman Garden. I asked this question to, to growers, 80 of them, and I said, do you think that which one of this one's A or B, which one is disease? And the big question behind it is think about it, what information do you extract from these photos? What, what are you extracting from the photos, right? So this are the results from those 80 people. Uh, of course, there's different generational uh, constrictions there, uh, and only a percentage of them answer. Um, it via text, half of them text, half of them through a link. But you see in here, I kind of agree with what you guys have. Sure, the, the B uh, looks sickly in there, and it's just an artifact of how I like to collect my data, but anyway, um, I, I just want to show you that there was a, people were kind of torn and a lot of them thought, okay, the disease is this one. But if we go to A, you know, I, I would go into, what do you see in there? You see yellowing, you know, the veins are green. Um, and in a high tunnel situation, you see this, your plants are young, you're not seeing a lot of problems, okay. Then your plants start growing up and maybe you're not trellising them enough or pruning or, or you know, getting them in our ventilation and humidity builds up. And on a dewy morning, you turn around the symptom and then you find the sign right there. So this particular sign 
you see in here is like this brown fuss under and when they bring it to the clinic this is what we see and A is actually the one that is disease and this is leaf mold and tomatoes grown in a high tunnel. Now B, which most of the growers said it was a disease, something infectious, was actually a nutritional imbalance. This guys will have no signs. This will start at the bottom of the plants, you know, from the bottom up. And if you do not correct it, then eventually the yellow, the chlorosis becomes more intense and then you have those little dots, the necrosis right there. So my point here for the growers is, you want to know what is really your problem. Because by knowing what the problem is, you take the best decisions possible and you're going to get the most out of you know, the investment that you're going to get in terms of pesticides, labor, etc. So for the case A, right, we have the leaf mold. What can you do to control this disease? First, resistant varieties that are really good tomato resistant varieties that are bred with good uh, genes for this particular pathogen. Now, if you go with one that you market, a variety that you market once, but it's not quite resistant, uh, you can do a lot with ventilation, pruning, training, maybe a little bit with fungicides, but this disease in a high tunnel really picks up um, and, and it can uh, cause quite a bit of damage on the leaves. <coughs> Okay, so now in terms of sanitation at the end of the season, make sure to remove the crop debris, clean out your high tunnel. Now, I did get a sample like this this year after uh, doing some extension programs in the spring, and the, the question was, you know, I remember your photos, and I think I have magnesium deficiency, but the question is, do I have leaf mold? And the answer was yes to both. This grower had magnesium deficiency, and after incubating the leaves, we saw the signs of leaf mold. Now, if you do only have magnesium deficiency, there is other things that you should be doing. This is the type of problem that will come up when you have an acidic soil, when you have low potassium uh, and calcium, and it's all about fertility management. And in those cases, then I'll go across the street, talk to Ajay Nair, and connect the grower with Ajay. <coughs> so my point here is really that for an accurate diagnostics, you need to look at the plant right and the symptoms then become clues but when it comes to diseases the science is what is the diagnostics right there so signs are diagnostic symptoms are clues and in the clinic we are part of a bigger diagnostic network it's called the national plant diagnostic network and our motto here is test don't guess and you can see why because if you take a guess on what the problem may be you're either wasting money or doing the wrong type of tactics to manage a problem. Now, the National Plant Diagnostic Network, this is the mission. We quickly detect and accurate, accurately identify plant pests and pathogens, and we communicate in a timely and accurate manner and accurate information. Uh, we are, you know, divided in regions for climate, for crops, for a lot of reasons. Um, and so that way, you know, we connect together. But the National Plant Diagnostic Network was established in 2007, um, first to enhance agricultural security through protecti protecting health and productivity of both agricultural uh, crops, you know, settings, but also natural ecosystems. And I think this also goes along with 9-11 uh, when biosecurity was a big deal. So it was the first time that someone said, what if someone threats our agriculture? What are we gonna do? So the NGN came along with uh, funding from the United States Department of Agriculture and the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. And you can see in here, there is a diagnostic, every dot in this map is a diagnostic lab um, in the United States. Now, most of us, like the Planet Insect Diagnostic Clinic, most of those clinics are in land-grant universities but the network also um, foster communication with federal agencies, with State Department of Ag, and even some uh, other stakeholders, labs that have some, uh, that we have communication with them. So in Iowa, we belong to the, Na uh, the North Central region. So this green part in there. Um, and I love this particular region because for me, it means mentoring. I get to learn from the people that have been doing this for 30 plus years. 
Um, and also, you know, you share your experience. We meet, the National Plant Diagnostic Network meets every spring. We go there, we do presentations. What did you see? What is new? What is normal? What is not? Um, and it's all about communication again. What are you doing? How are you testing this or that? Now, locally here, this is our, our presence. We are the Plant Insect Diagnostic Clinic. This is our website. You know, the way that we tell our clients is we diagnose plant problems, but we also identify uh, insects, mushrooms, plants, etc. Most of what we do is confirming common problems. And it sometimes it's something that, you know, may be a little odd, and then we want to look into it. Now, the top five reasons why people submit a sample to the clinic would be if they have problems and they want help, and that includes anyone, growers, you know, arborists, homeowners, gardeners, you name it. This number one, the number two will be things are dying quickly um, and they need help. Now, often it's because they went to the internet and they thought it was A, and they said, oh, I'm pretty sure my pet has fire blight, can you confirm? Or, you know, oh, I think I have INSB, can you test? We do get a lot of this, um, and, you know, it brings a good point in there. There's a lot of problems that can look alike, the symptoms look alike, and so then you really need to test. Now, sometimes you, you have people that have a lot of experience, and they've never seen something like what they're experiencing. So in those cases, they'll say, boy, I don't know if this is a variety thing, but these symptoms are new to me. Or, you know, we, our role too is to check for invasives. And, and Laura does a lot of that with, with insects, with educating people, and what are the things and insects that are moving around that we should not be moving firewood when you camp, don't do it, because that's how those insects hitchhike with your wood uh, into other states. <coughs> and, you know, often we also have people that either they're applying something and it's not working, and the, ideally we want them to con contact us before so that they don't necessarily waste that money. You know, it's like, okay, we understand that you may already have treated, and that happens because people do it, but often we have cases where people thought and were convinced that the problem was an insect or a disease, and it was not. So that right there was a wasted application of a pesticide. Okay, what is a good sample versus a bad sample? It's all about what the pathogen is. If you think about it, anything that is an aerial here that causes blight or spots, anything aerial like a canker, all those, if you just send us leaves, some stems, you know, we can, we can do most of the diagnostics with that. Good sample is important, transit uh, time is a problem. But if we're talking about a <coughs> welding or a root rot, then those really need specific samples. And that's hard for us to convey uh, because then people think that maybe our testing goes like human. You go, you go to your physician and what do they do? They just take a little bit of blood. So in theory, you could do that with the plants, maybe, but we can't. We really need the root system or we really need the stem or branches depending on the, the plant that we're talking about. In some cases, we tell our uh, growers and clients in general, if you're not sure, send us photos. We love digital photos because they inform the symptoms in the field, the pattern that you're seeing, you know, it, it, it shows us what structures are around, photos are great, and then we can definitely tell you what type of plant uh, part or sample to submit. But we do not provide a diagnosis photo only because then we'll be missing the sign, we'll be missing the evidence if it's really a disease. Okay, just <coughs> quickly here, clinic.ipm.ist, this is our website. And then if you go there, you see submission forms. This is how we communicate with our clients. Our, our patients don't talk, so all the information that we can extract from uh, our client is very important. Uh, and here we have the identification and also the, the nematode service in there. We do have different pages by uh, crop type or plant type. You need different things depending on the plant that you're having problems with. And in the clinic right now, we have uh, Dr. Jesse Isles, um, who is the entomologist and clinic director. I really value that we have an entomologist in our clinic. Other clinics in, in the North Central region have separate clinics. And often, it, 
you know, something arrives, I looked at it and I say, I don't know, maybe some powder down what is this fuss? And then you look at it under the dissecting scope, it's like, oh, there's something crawling in there and this is webbing, I better check with Laura. So definitely it helps a lot. Um, Ed, who does a lot of the field crumbs, and he graciously helped me with the conifers because there's a lot of conifers that get submitted. Um, and I work mainly on horticultural crops, trees, ornamentals, anything that we eat. So let's see. So in the clinic, we um, do post a, an update of what's happening on the clinic, what you've seen. And here I, we post cool pictures of symptoms, um, signs, insects, and a big shout out for the social media people that manage the plant pathology department uh, accounts because they definitely help us, you know, increase our reach. Uh, they retweet, they post their updates, so thank you. Um, we also do, uh, Laura, Ed and I, we do a lot of uh, publications, either updating or, you know, reviewing, and all this is through the extension store. One that uh, just, there was great publication that Dr. Gleason had many years ago, and we'll just, you know, need a little bit of tweaks, names have changed, new things were added, um, and it's right there, and it's uh, free for everyone to download. We are also are into social media, it's just one way to engage with more Iowans, as much, as many Iowans as possible, uh, right there, but, you know, our, our, with Hafizi coming to the clinic, then we thought, we need to, you know, talk more about what we do to our grad students. And so, what are the opportunities for grad students to interact with the clinic? It's great experience, and as a matter of fact, as a grad student, I volunteer at the Michigan State Clinic. And that's how I discovered that this is the passion of, you know, you go to work and you worry, man, it's gonna be eight hours of my day, of every day, you have to love what you do. So you have to find what you love, right? So. Opportunities for grad students, I'll go from short investment of time to higher investment of time. You can join a tour uh, with the PIDC. In a given year, we give two to three tours. This year, we had STEM kids coming along. We had the Greenhouse Association, Greenhouse Manager Associations. We had a group from China, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some. So if you ever want to join a tour, just shoot me an email and we'll keep you posted. Now, we, the clinic also does uh, part of a class that is called Extension Experience. And in this class, the student comes, uh, they come to the clinic, you know, four to six sessions of one or two hours. And then we, we show them things, we say things, we discuss this kind of like what we learn. Uh, Laura has been doing this a lot more than I have. I, this is my third year here. Uh, and so it's really nice to have that discussion and ultimately whatever you go if you become a faculty you and, and you have an extension responsibility you're going to be likely responding to questions from a grower that says so what's this you know and, you, and if you get that that process of how you do diagnostics then you say you know what i'll take it to my lab and i'll do it or i partner with my clinic in the in the state that i'm on and you do it oh and I hit the first <coughs> one, sorry. Okay, the students that do uh, the extension experience, they also contribute to encyclopedia articles. So we're hoping that this will be a great way for students to get experience writing extension articles. Um, and we use this on a daily basis, you know. When I am replying to your client with a diagnosis, I will include the link for whatever, you know, if we have it here, I'll just include that link. And then that way, it's a short, it's a brief information that the client wants to read and that it tells them what to do in terms of management. All right, um, other things to do, Master Gardener. So the Master Gardener program is run by the Horticultural Department, uh, the Horticultural Department, and they have sections that have a lot for anyone and everyone. Uh, you sign up, you learn about propagating plants, you learn about soil, you name it, and in including entomology and plant pathology. So what we do is we um, have a lecture with them on a, on a Tuesday night. They listen to why plants get sick and what makes them sick. And then they come on a Saturday in October, twice, so there's two Octobers, two Saturdays in October that we do this. 
And so this, you know, we, we have some hands-on experience so that they can connect all the different concepts that they learn, hopefully, by reading their materials, by participating on the webcast. Um, and then they go there, and we have great students that, you know, I had amazing volunteers that have helped me improve this program. And Hafizi this year, and he's going to talk about that, he helped me rethink the activity so that people are really thinking and experiencing something different. Because we can stand somewhere and talk and talk and talk, but then at the end of the day, what, what did they learn if they didn't experience anything and if they were not using you know, their brain to think about the problem? So with that, I'm going to give it to Hafizi so that he can explain how is that um, he volunteered in the summer with the clinic. Uh, thank you, Lina. So I will start, I'll begin my part of my talk by showing you guys where is Malaysia loca located at on the world map. So this <laughs> is the world map, and this is Malaysia. And if you take a closer look, Malaysia is located in the Southeast Asia, divided by the uh, South China Sea, separated Malaysia into two parts. One is the West Malaysia, which comprises of consists of 11 states, and the East Malaysia consists of two states. The total land mass of Malaysia is about 127,000 square miles, equivalent to when you combine Minnesota and Iowa together. That's how small Malaysia is. But the population of Malaysia is over 30 million. And some of the countries that never into Malaysia, are such as Thailand, Thailand, Singapore, Brunei, Indonesia, and also Philippines. Malaysia is known for some reason, and here are some of them. One is the capital, big capital city of Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, which is the main attraction for tourism. And the second one is because of this most controversial fruit of all named durian. <laughs> So I'm just curious, a show of hands, who's here has never heard of durian before today? Well, uh, well, I put some of the durian candy in the back, in a little cup for you guys. Uh, I encourage you guys to, to try in the name of research. Uh, but it's actually a process of durian, so it's not really similar, but it's worth the try. So. Uh, <laughs> so I would like to point out that whoever, um, so in, in, in for if you ask people coming from the uh, country from the Southeast Asia, we know durian as a king of fruit. But I personally would like for the whoever came up with the recognition to revise because these are definitely not the expression of impression that a king should get. <laughs> so the first two pictures on the left, bottom left, I have the screenshot that I got from the videos on YouTube showing Americans first try durian. You should check on this video on YouTube, they are hilarious in the swimming pool. And then the, the far right is showing a sign showing that no durian is allowed. So if you go to the countries in the Southeast Asia, you will see this kind of a sign a lot in enclosed buildings such as hotels, such as hotels, or in the taxi or in the trains. For good reasons, mainly it's because of the smell. So the smell of durian has been described in various ways. Some of them describe as a cheese you add with old jean socks together. <laughs> However, I somewhere that I, I read somewhere that the taste of the flesh, uh, the, the custody texture and the sweetness of the flesh resemble creme brulee or caramelized banana, which I'm not sure how the the comparison between them because I have never tried any of those. But that's, that's durian. <laughs> so uh, the agriculture sector in Malaysia contributes to the 12% of the total economic resources in Malaysia. And 24% of the land in Malaysia is dedicated to agriculture. And Malaysia are among the top exporters of natural uh, rubbers and palm oil. And countries such as China and uh, Germany are the among the top countries that we export these two communities the most. 
Uh, some other crops that are uh, cultivated in Malaysia for domestic use are such as uh, rice, banana, coconut, durian, star fruit, uh, rambutan, and mangosteen. I'm not sure if any of you have tried any of these, but certainly Dr. Mark Gleason have tried mangosteen, which according to him, according to him, much way better than durian. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So the agriculture industry in Malaysia is governed by the Ministry of Agriculture and Agrobase, we call it as MOA. And other industry uh, governed by this MOA, uh, such as a veterinary and also fishery industry. And this different industry is separated into different departments, in where in each department has different uh, federal agencies which have been assigned with different function and provide different services. And for the agriculture department, Department of Agriculture, here are some of the uh, federal agencies. One is MARGI, which focus on the research and development in agriculture. And the second one uh, is Jabatan Pertanian, an agency that is responsible for registration of new pesticide, a new plant cultivar, and also responsible for giving out license and permit for import and export. And the last agency under the, uh, the agriculture department is Pharma that's focusing on the marketing side. And to go along with what Lina just presented with the TIDC at Iowa State University, I will just focus on this particular agency which provides somewhat similar services what you have uh, in the TIDC at Iowa State University. This is a print screen, a screenshot from the website of this agency that provides the crop pest diagnostic services which somewhat um, offers in the PIDC where it allows farmers and others to send in sample and the uh, science officer will go this, uh, will do the diagnos di diagnosis and they will provide the plant disease management advices to the growers. The agriculture industry in Malaysia is somewhat in a good shape under this federal agency under the MOA. <coughs> the question is where do the university experts fit into this picture? Currently none. There's no clo close connectivity or relationship between the university experts at the university level with the agriculture industry in Malaysia. And this is a picture showing the top four universities in Malaysia which uh, have been recognized currently, currently as research university, which makes the main focus of this university is research and publication, more research and more publication. So the fact that coming from a country which the universities have no close relationship with the agricultural uh, industry in Malaysia, and before coming to the Iowa State University, I did not know that a clinic for plant actually was a real thing. So having the PIDC <laughs> next to the graduate office, which I pass by, walk by every day, which make, always make me wonder what they're actually doing in there. Mm -hmm. Of course, I would not expect to see them with a stethoscope around their neck. Mm -hmm. But I actually I always wanted to know what, how they handle their patient. So that's why uh, last summer, I talked to uh, Laura, Alina, and Ed, uh, kind of uh, giving some opportunity for me to help them in the clinic, to, to for me to get this exposure in the clinic, which is kind of new for me, which coming from Malaysia. And here are some of the things that I picked up, um, that I learned uh, when helping in the clinic in the summer. And there's a lot of things that I learned, but here are some of them that I counted out. What I learned is being a diagnostician is not the same as being there. When I first uh, working in the clinic, I had this one sample that Lina gave me. I was so excited. I devout, devoted all my time uh, observing this sample using the microscope. I made slide, but, uh, more slide and more slide without, you know, without noticing there's a lot of diagnostician ahead of me like waiting to use the microscope until Lina was like, hey, I think it's not necessary to observe this. It's not necessary to do this. Well, my point is, being a diagnostician, you need, uh, you have a certain timeline because I came in as a student, which used to do a research, which you devote all the time that you, you embrace every moment. 
And you cannot do that working in the clinic because that is only one sample where you have a lot more waiting for you behind, waiting to be observed. So one thing that I learned the most is in the clinic, being the administration is what to search and when to stop. And the second thing that I experienced is uh, we had this triage routine where we put all the samples that was uh, submitted to the clinic on the bench and we gathered together all the diagnostician together with me that we, I call it a moment of wow because we went through every sample and all of the diagnostician will show off their knowledge you know, I know this, this is that, this is that which I really impressed and this is also the moment that I would like to describe when where the Agrio's plant pathology book comes alive where I got the chance to see all the plant diseases that I learned from, that I learned from the book and I also got the chance to see some of the weird cool galls on the plant that made by insects these are some of the photos here and I also got the chance of volunteering the clinic to learn some of the, the, some of the diseases uh, that I did not learn from the book where I just found out that by, by working in the clinic I just found out that um, apple scab and pear scab is caused by two different species of venturia and I also had the experience uh, helping Lina uh, volunteer uh, with the master gardener as uh, Lina mentioned that I helped her a little bit on revising the activities on the booklet that was given to the master gardener training so I got the experience uh, volunteering the clinic and I also had the experience working with Lina with the master gardener. So what's next? So University of Science Malaysia is the university where I will affiliate with uh, beginning in January 2018. And I, I, I look this as an opportunity to suggest the new university and to get, uh, to initiate the involvement of the university experts to the uh, agriculture industry in Malaysia and I would like to see the bridge that currently connecting the community and also the, this federal agency be extended to the university as well and with this little experience in the clinic and also helping with the master gardener I kind of see myself to initiate the first PIDC and also master gardener in Malaysia I know it sounds ambitious and near impossible to achieve, but I will start with a little baby steps. Mm -hmm. So there are some of the things that I pick up by uh, helping in the clinic during summer. Now, I would like to go back with this picture that Shina showed all of you as a quiz in the beginning. So this was actually one of the sample that brought in in the clinic, which me and Lina worked closely together, where the farmer concerned on the hops dummy mildew. And we thought this is kind of interesting sample that uh, we should share with all of you. And I will tell you uh, why in, in, in a short while. So we, we start this sample by the traditional diagnosis. We look at the uh, symptoms. As you can see the yellowing, also the browning on the leaf. And on the, uh, on the side of the leaf, you can see some sporulation, which you may or may not, uh, may or may not be present, depending on the uh, humidity. And we took this, uh, look under the microscope, and you see the signs with uh, the, the bottom of photos is showing the sporulation underneath uh, the leaf, and you, you can see the uh, uh, sporangia uh, under the leaf, uh, under the magnification under the compound microscope. I will start by going uh, through uh, briefly the general dummy mildew disease cycle that we know, and this is uh, showing the dummy mildew on grapes. Uh, in spring, as the uh, sporangia mature, it will release the zoospore that will disperse to the plant parts. In this case, it's showing uh, the, the leaf and also the fruit. Where as the infection um, in continues, the pathogen will sporulate under the leaf, under, under the side of the leaf. You can see the uh, sporangia here, and the pathogen will above winter on the pollen leaf. And this is the general uh, disease cycle of dummy mildew on, um, that we all know. Now, this is the disease cycle showing dummy mildew on hops. Okay, what in the, the interesting part is after uh, the zoospore being dispersed on the plant parts such as uh, leaves and uh, corns and shoots, they begin the infection and the pathogen can cause 
the infection systemically go down to infect the crown and butt. This is where the pathogen overwinters. And these are the two things that uh, when, when I say that being a diagnostician, you need to know what to search, where to search. And I will pass uh, the next uh, presentation to Lina. She will further describe this particular sample that we work together. Here you go. So, as you can see, this to me, you know, when I learned this type of systemic infection, it was totally new for me. Um, you always expect some sort of overwintering in the debris, but then when a perennial crop and you have this overwintering there, then what do you do, right? Um, the traditional diagnosis, you see it during the summer, you see the sporangia, but what happens in the early, you know, at the beginning, uh, when you're not seeing signs yet? Now, hops is, is more of a trend these days, you know? It started when all the breweries opened and everyone wanted to do their own beer, and so now everyone wants to have their own hop yard. And it comes with a problem when you have a, such a young industry and the things that fall to the cracks. You know, virus indexing is a problem uh, with hops. There's a lot of virus that are being moved because it, this plant propagates really easily. I did it this spring. And it was like, cut, boom, done. And it grew a while. Um, and so this also becomes a problem, right? <coughs> you can't have cuttings that come with the disease. And that's a, it can be a pretty big deal. So in one of our North Central meetings, the Wisconsin Clinic mentioned that they were working on helping hop growers in the industry in Wisconsin to get cleaner uh, with a lot of testing. And they do a lot of testing for hops and people that want to propagate and move plants and sell those cuttings. And so then uh, going back to you know the main symptom of what you will see for that infection that is systemic and that will not spoilate as easily is you'll have those shoots that are infected. Uh, they're yellow. Uh, they're curled. They're, they're called spikes. Uh, and they look kind of odd, but to go back into the picture, it can look like this. If we put this to an incubation box or a humidity chamber, we won't get any uh, spoliation. We tried. Uh, I also tried putting them in like uh, agar plates and incubate them longer, and they wouldn't. So I reached out to the clinic in Wisconsin and I said, would you send me some of your DNA for a control? And what primers are you using? So this grower, you know, after doing his, his homework, he uh, contacted us and said, do you guys do systemic detection of down and older? And I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm just gonna get some DNA. Uh, sure, uh, I can try, but I can promise anything. So sure, he sent this, um, and he also sent this once. And then I called back and I said, okay, um, talk to me about this. And I said, and he said, yeah, yeah, I put some herbicide on. So a lot of the things that you see in here is a burn uh, from an herbicide right there. And the curling comes from that. Um, so then, you know, I bless him in disguise. Hafizi comes in and I said, hey, I need to implement. Remember, I'm a diagnostician. I don't do research. I implement and test things. So then we went ahead and in here um, we have one of the, the original sample that we had that actually had sporulation, um, and you can see in here the, the, the sporulation in there. So what we did is we collected, Hafizi collected the lesions that had sporulation and froze that in a tube. A, you know, 178A, uh, 89A, and she, he collected that tissue and we froze that. Um, and we did that for B, and we did all that DNA extraction all together. But because one of the things that when you're trying to do a detection of a pathogen on asymptomatic tissue is you need to have controls. So of course I got the control from Wisconsin, but then when I run out of that, then what? So I had a PC then also do, uh, I was wondering if I needed to extract DNA every time to make a control, or if I could just keep the raw spore suspension as a control. And so we run that this way. Uh, we just had the DNA spore, collected the spores, put them in a tube with water, and extract that along with this tissue. And, you know, it, it worked out. Um, so we had the original traditional diagnosis confirmed. We had the non spoilating uh, amplified. And this one was kind of a, we talk about it a lot, um, and was like, well, we have a faint in here. What could be going on? Um, 
And the way that I report this one to the girl was, you know, we had a faint band, and I don't, I can't tell you that this is positive. I think that it's inconclusive, and it may be due to, at this point, you may have uh, the epidemic is going in your hop yard, and maybe we just catch one or two uh, sporangia there, but I wouldn't call that positive. Um, so that was kind of an interesting idea. I think the more the network goes towards quickly detect, um, implementing this type of uh, protocols to look for asymptomatic, uh, you know, plants that that may start showing problems. Um, a lot of the annual crops, you kind of go with, oh yeah, they look fine in the greenhouse. Uh, put them in the in the field, and then maybe you have missed something, you know. Uh, and it's hard because if you introduce a really bad pathogen, then problems can really explode in your field. So this was kind of an interesting thing that Hafizi helped with um, and that we both learned. Again, I was not aware of the systemic infection um, and it kind of got me thinking, what do you need to have a good implementation of any protocol that a researcher um, would create? So let's see, what else do I have in here? Oh, okay. No, I was, uh, one thing that I didn't mention is we tried to use a technique that Hafizi had really good success with um, and we just collected a very similar tissue and tried prepan, and we're not quite sure what it didn't work. Um, you know, since this is more of a raw extraction, we were thinking maybe the hop tissue has a lot of other inhibitors, we're not sure, uh, but it was definitely a good try because it's way faster than trying to do a regular DNA extraction. So, just to summarize, um, think about that for, in my eyes, signs are diagnostics where the symptoms are clues. There's always all this backstory to a sample. Uh, and so when I find the sciences, when I feel more confident that I have given you the best possible answer, and that from there you can take the best possible decisions to manage a problem. It's important that you guys hopefully picked up this, but diagnosticians do not work alone. Uh, you know, we have Ed, Laura, and I, we work together. We, when we do the triage, we kind of bounce ideas. We have colleagues locally, Dr. Harrington, Dr. Gleason, that we you know, connect with. Also in horticulture, in agronomy. Oh, is this herbicide? I have no idea. We always connect with people. And through the National Plant Diagnostic Network, we have national colleagues. There is a listserv. I tried to key this fungi out, and I've been here for hours. What do you guys think I'm missing? What should I look for? Tell me what to try. And this is what the National Plant Diagnostic Network does for us. And for PC. <laughs> so the, for the last two summary, and we gave the clinic uh, kind of give me some hands on experience for grad students. Uh, we really, really like for, to encourage you guys to kind of uh, take this opportunity, which we now already emphasize that the clinic open for any volunteer, which I learned a lot. As, and, and again, it's something that I would like to describe as Agrius Plant Pathology book comes alive. Because in the book, what you read is just like straightforward. This is the this is the pathogen, and you don't, don't never know what will happen with the real sample when it brought in because it only, always depends on the stage of the disease and also the you know the sign of symptoms whether it's present or not. And being as an international student, I always come back to the main reason why I was sent here by my government, which you know they they. they kind of expect me to learn all the new things or the good things that I should pick up from here and I, that could be implemented in my own country. And I would like to uh, take this opportunity well to thank uh, Laura, Lina and also Ed. Thank you for all the help and also the experience and all, all, all the knowledge that you have given me. And with that, I think we can end our presentation and I would like to, to get uh, any questions from you. Yeah. Questions? Chelsea. Uh, do you think that if you continue uh, moving forward with more molecular diagnostics, you guys need to increase your diagnostic fees at all? I think so. Yeah, um, you know, I'm always looking for what steps can we jump. The prep one was one of those. Uh, it's, it's less labor. Uh, there are things that are cheaper. Can we do direct PCR from a tissue? Yeah, it, it, but yeah, it goes with an increase of, and it, it won't be for every diagnostics, right. you know, every diagnostics that we do, it will be just some cases here and there where there is the need mm -hmm. and it makes sense. 
maybe we like a supplemental fee to the original fee. Yep, that's how we have it um, in our submission form now. There is uh, an additional fee depending on what it is. Yep. Mark? Just I had a question about other samples that aren't going to give you obvious correlation or something else, but a little bit like you're down in the sample, maybe some viruses. How do you make your decision as to whether you're going to go to a, a PCR or, or some kind of molecular diagnostic technique? Um, I mean, it's a sample sent in, so so how do you, it, it costs some money, it costs some time, so how do you triage that? So for that one, it was very easy because the grower requested it. Um, and that's, that's very important. We always tell them, use the second page and tell us what you want. I mean, and we see if we can either refer you to a clinic that does it in the, in nationally or see if we can help you. Um, I think it's a really good question. Uh, and I don't think that we're going to have a detection test for everything. Um, it's going to be very specific things. Uh, and we have to focus our efforts because it's, it's a three, you know, it's the three of us plus some undergrads, and we kind of have to start slow, small, and, and decide where are we going to focus our efforts and what makes sense. More questions? Yeah. Uh, how long it took you to diagnose this sample? I mean, with the feces help, it was it was ten days. It was ten days. Is this? Um, are there many samples? Would you repeat that? Uh, how, uh, what's the percentage of samples you need to spend such a long time to demo? Yeah, I, I want to say, so a lot of things we have to culture, because people want, they write, oh, I'm, I looked online and it's verticillium, or I called the whole line and it's verticillium. Like, Whoa, wait, what? Um, so normally we, we do test, and if they have to culture, then it's a full two weeks. You know, we start looking at the cultures of four, seven, ten, but sometimes uh, there are things that take the full 14 days, um, and and that's what we promise two day, uh, two <laughs> two weeks uh, re results. Yeah, uh, we do have an option that if the test if they're testing for something that is a virus and we have serology, we can give them uh, next day results. So we just run it and let them know. Um, but we don't have a lot of those options. You know, fast turnaround. And right now, you know, even with this detection, uh, we don't tell the grower, oh, it's going to be two days. Especially it was the first time we were doing it, it was like, well, be just patient because it may take me a month. And he's like, oh, no problem. I just want to learn how the spikes look so that I can destroy them when I need to. I'm like, okay, sure. You know, it's a different, it's a different case in there. But yeah, there's some cases that I'll say like, I'll try this, but I'm not sure. Be patient. And some people say, oh, don't worry about it. I, I got enough from your service you know, from your recommendations that I, I'll just move on with those. While other people definitely want to go, oh yeah, characterize that for me, please. Yeah. More questions? Yes. So, do you guys have any kind of questionnaire that you follow? Like, you see like, what's plan part and what kind of symptoms are available and what kind of test we have to go to? Or just a general <coughs> procedure we go to? Eh, well, yes. <laughs> 